Well, this is Olive Sheep Ministries, and as people are turning, we're going to be turning to Second Peter. Also, his Hebrew name is Kepha. We're going to be in chapter 2. That's where we're going to start. But I'm going to have to go back up just a little bit into chapter 1 so that we can get a feel for where we are. And I'm going to open up in prayer in just a moment. But what I want to do is, this is a message that I've been wanting to share. And this was the first message that I wanted to bring and to give the first day of Olive Shoot Ministries. But I also felt the need to understand and teach about the appointed times. So this is a message that has been on my heart for a while. And uh, praying about which book to start in after the appointed times, the uh, festivals of Yahweh. And Second Peter was something me and my wife were reading, and it struck me that, it's, that it needed to be taught and needed to be understood before we get into the book of Ezekiel or Yehezekiel. Been having some audio issues, so the first chapter I have done, but you see my lips moving with no sound. I won't be able to post that online. I'm going to have to redo it. But hopefully this will be better. And I hope this will be something that all will enjoy. It's also going to be a little controversial. But I'm going to speak from my heart. And I'm going to do so in love. Because it's time for the body of Messiah to open its eyes. And get back to his word. And come back to him. Because we've been too far away. For far too long. So if you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for everything that you've done, for the many blessings that you've given me and my wife, for the many blessings that you've uh, provided for us, for finding a vehicle that's, uh, Father, that was awesome for all the things that have taken place this past two weeks, and for the ministry that you've called us to. Father, we look forward to serving you faithfully and full-time in this ministry and to bring others to you. Open their hearts to your word. Open our hearts to your word. Give me the words to say and help us to understand what is what you've given to us. We love you. We praise you. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, going back, we're going to we'll go back to verse 19 in for the first chapter. Uh, because I did a whole complete chapter and condensed it. I might not get through chapter 2, but... Um, I'm going to try. First off, we need to understand what the scriptures are. If we look back in chapter 1 of Second Peter, or Kepha, we see it says, And we have the prophetic word made more certain, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns. Let me read from my translation. It says morning star. So then we possess a more well-founded prophetic message to which you do well to carefully cons- consider it as a lamp shining in a dark and miserable place until the day it might become visible and a bright light might rise up in your hearts. While recognizing this first, that every prophetic writing does not come about from one's own personal explanation, because prophecy was not at any time brought about by man's will, but rather by men being carried about by the set-apart spirit of Yahweh. We need to understand this before we get into the into chapter 2, because he's saying he's... Kepha is speaking about the prophetic, having a more sure prophetic word. He's talking about the time when they're on the mountain, the transfiguration, when he saw Yeshua in his esteem, in his honor, you know, that splendor and majesty that he was on the mountain with, with Moshe and with Elijah, Eliyahu, with him standing there beside him. And he's talking about this because he says that it is prophecy and it's made more sure and it's more steadfast, more founded. And the reason being is that the Old Testament, that people call it the Old Testament, is the Torah, which is the Hebrew Scriptures. There are 22 books, which we have it divided up into 39 because some books we've got divided that the Hebrews have together, like Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. We've got them divided into two sections. They were considered, each one was considered one book. So all this pointed to Messiah. And the prophets who spoke, which is what we're getting ready to talk about, is they spoke about the Messiah who was to come. And they also spoke about prophetic events. And what they wrote, what they spoke about, was written. Like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Zechariah, Amos, all these prophets wrote 
about the Messiah, about the coming age, the millennial kingdom. And they were pointing to a time. And what he also says is that if you, in First Peter, he talks about the prophets searching out, I think it's in chapter 1, where it says that they, in, in chapter 1, 10 and 11, it says, concerning this deliverance the prophets have sought out and searched out, prophesying concerning the favor for you, searching to know what or what sort of time the spirit which was in them was pointing out concerning Messiah, when it was bearing witness beforehand the suffering of Messiah, sufferings of Messiah, and the esteem or majesty that would follow, to whom it was revealed that they were not serve, they were serving not themselves but you in these matters which now have been announced to you to those who brought the good news to you by the set apart spirit sent from heaven, into which the messengers long to look into. So what he's saying here is that all these prophets were trying to figure out what they were being told to see if it pointed to them and they've come to the knowledge that they were writing for a future generation. And yes, they were they were prophets. And this is where we get uh, really caught up in a bunch of a bunch of junk. Is the only word I can think of. Prophecy, the prophetic writings of what Kepha is talking about, is the scriptures. But when you just say that it's the Bible that is the prophetic writing, there was a lot of prophets out there. There's a lot of prophets that were sent to Israel even during the time uh, that we have you know, with Hosea and some of the other prophets during Isaiah's time. Huldah was a prophetess that was consulted instead of Isaiah even during that time. So there's a prophetess. You've got something of what she said, but there's a, there was a lot of other prophets that were sent that we don't have any record of what they, what they said. But they were sent by Yahweh to his people. So just saying that the Bible is prophetic, which it is, but that's the only prophecy that we have or need, I think would be a lie. But also looking at some of these other manuscripts like the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, you know, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of the Epistle of Judas, you know, the Gospel of Mary, you know, some of these extra biblical works, people consider them scripture when they're not. They're not prophetic. You have to test it, and I think the spirit that we have in us, which is the set-apart spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, is in us, and it gives us an understanding of what these scriptures are and whether or not we need to take heed to them. And this is something that Shaul talks about in, in Corinthians. So the prophetic writings that Kepha is talking about here is what the prophets wrote in the Torah, which is the Hebrew scriptures. And he says that these did not come about from one's own personal explanation. Okay? There's a lot of people trying to explain scripture, and this is what's going on today. There's a lot of people explaining scripture, and they're using their own personal explanation of it when they're ignoring the context. And what I mean by that is they will take and pull one verse out of, out of its complete context, and then they'll explain it to a point to their own personal agenda. John Calvin did this. Augustine did this. The ones that they claim are church fathers, they did this. They took certain passages or certain verses, and they built a whole theology around it. And it's still going on. Now, since we're going to be talking about false prophets and false teachers, we know that all prophecy was not was given by Yahweh for a particular purpose. So what is a prophet? We're going to get ready to go into chapter 2, and I'm going to do this you know, as we go. So what is a prophet? Here's a definition. This is what I learned in seminary. I'll tell you what, before I get started, let me read. Let's see, where do I go to? Let's... Let's read the first three verses. But there were also false prophets among the people, as there will also be false prophets among you who will introduce destructive teachings in addition to denying the owner who bought them or redeemed them. And then many will imitate their unrestrained, self-abandoning behavior through whom the genuine path will be slanderously defamed. And so with covetousness, they will exploit you with fabricated messages whose long-awaited judgment is not inactive and their destruction is not sleeping. That's pretty harsh words. False teachers and false prophets. This is something that he does too, is he talks about the false prophets that were among the people. He's talking about the false prophets among Israel, which you see that Eliyahu, Elijah, confronted on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal. He confronted them there, and you, we all know the story. Hopefully we all know the story with uh, 
setting up the altar and saying, if telling the people, look, if Yahweh is the sovereign one, if he's the one to worship, then worship him. If Baal is the sovereign one, worship him, but quit teetering between the two. You need to make a decision. There was the false prophets, and he kind of shows that there's going to be false teachers. He makes an equation there. You know, equates the two together, false prophets and false teachers. Now, when I was in seminary, we talked about prophets, and this is one of the main points that in and I can speak about Baptist seminaries because I spent most of my seminary, well, all my seminary degree in Southern Baptist or Baptist seminaries. And it says, are modern day prophets, or are there modern day prophets, or is there a need for prophets? And here is a definition that is a seminary Baptist, Southern Baptist seminary definition of a prophet. It says, scripture shows that the prophets of the New Testament had two primary purposes. They were gifted men, given to the church, and appointed he said, by God, Elohim, for the purpose of helping to lay the foundation of the church. They, like the apostles, received Elohim's revelation and the truth and proclaimed it to their churches. It is important to remember that the early church did not have a completed Bible. So Elohim granted this revelation for the purpose of teaching his message to the church. The New Testament prophets also spoke forth and taught the apostles' doctrine. Everything taught by these prophets had to be consistent with the teaching of the apostles. So he's saying that they taught the apostles. One of the main things is that people believe that the prophet only spoke of things beforehand. Because the word prophetes means tell beforehand. Pro meaning before and prophetes which is to speak or tell something beforehand. They did. They spoke beforehand. They spoke of things that were going to happen in the future event but that's not the main reason why the prophets were sent. Most people go to Deuteronomy 18.18 18, where Moshe said that Yahweh will raise up a prophet like him among his among your brothers, and you need to pay attention to him. They say that's the first place that the word prophet, which in Hebrew is navi, is given. But that's not true. It goes all the way back to Genesis 20, verse 7, when Abimelech, or Bimelech, Abimelech means my father is king, took Abram's wife, Sarah. And Yahweh closed up all the wombs and then gave him a dream and said, you need to return this man's wife. You take another man's wife. He said, I did it innocently. He said, the man, Abram, or Avram, is my prophet. He's a prophet. So that's the use of the word Navi. That's the first use that I found is in Genesis 20, verse 7. Now, what did the prophet do? Did he prophesy? Yes, he prophesied. But one of the main things is, even though he did predict future events his concern was that the people have turned away from Yahweh they've turned away from his word they've gone into idolatry they've gone into immorality and they're basically violating the Torah and Yahweh would call certain individuals to go to the people and give a message of warning telling them to come back to him or this is going to happen so the prophet's message was conditional. It was conditional because when he gave something the people had to make a determination whether or not to heed his warning and come back to Yahweh or ignore his warning and this future thing that he was predicting was going to come about upon them. And they did predict the future sufferings of the Messiah. And what is concerning is most people focus on the prophecy as those foretelling of events and they ignore the fact that according to Jeremiah 6.15 and some places in Jeremiah and Ezekiel 33 that the prophet themselves were equated with the shofar which when we studied about Yom Teruah we understand the blowing of the shofar that Yahweh gave prophets as watchmen over Israel and they were shofars blowing a warning to the people warning them to come back so prophet gave a warning message and it had to be heeded so one of the things that a prophet does is he proclaims Yahweh's word and he gives a warning now there's a lot of hell and hellfire and brimstone preachers out there that I think take the Bible bat and beat it over people's heads with it, beat them with their sin without explaining redemption and Yahweh's compassion. But there are others who consider themselves prophets because they want to have the office of prophet and they consider themselves having the gift of prophecy. And with these you have a bunch of people A lot of people 
spewing out a lot of foretold events and you wonder are these things going to happen now you can read the news newspaper you can watch the news and you can make some judgment you know when we're driving and I see the sky it looks kind of hazy and gray and it's you got the smell of rain in the air I tell my wife it's going to rain and she says how do you know that usually I'm right she still thinks I'm only 98% right half the time but you know I'm trying to convince her that I'm right 100% of the time but I know it because I look for the signs and some people can look for signs and see what's going to happen so they can bolster themselves by saying they're making something making a prophetic statement and people look at there's something special now they also look at Ephesians 4.11 because it says, you know, Sheol said that the Messiah gave gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teaching shepherds. And they consider this an office to attain to. The prophet is not an office. The prophet is a gift to the body of Messiah as a shofar, Yahweh, warning his people to quit violating his word. That is a gift. Amos and some of the other prophets were called from, you know, tending their father's sheep, tending the the groves where their father was, their the vineyard, and they were called, and they were sent with a message. And one of the things happened is when they were sent to the people, the people didn't want to listen to them. And that's something in, that Jeremiah was told that, you know, they're not going to listen to you. You know, you take this message to them regardless of whether they listen to you or not, because I know they're not going to listen to them. But you're going to tell them this is a warning. So that's a prophetic message. Yes, prophets are for this time, but you don't work in that office of prophet. And like what's being said here, Kepha said there was also false prophets among the people. There's also going to be false teachers among you who will introduce destructive teachings. See, the false prophets during the time of Elijah were pointing the people to Baal or Baal and were leading the people into immorality. The false teachers today are doing the exact same thing. Now how do you tell who is a false teacher or a false prophet? And this is something that I wanted to teach on before. And let's turn over to Deuteronomy 13. Because most people say that if a person is a prophet, he's going to foretell an event. And if that event doesn't happen, then he's a false prophet. Okay. I'm going to disagree with that. That's what I was taught in seminary. But that's a lie. And I'm going to show you why it's a lie. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, this is something everybody needs to understand. You need to read Deuteronomy chapter 13, and you need to test everything that you hear by Scripture and give it the Deuteronomy 13 test. Even everything that I'm saying up here, don't take my word for it. Study the Scriptures, because I don't have the corner market on the truth. This is Yahweh's word. Now, like I said, in seminary I was taught that a prophet only spoke of four or only foretold events that were going to happen in the future. And if they didn't happen, he was a false prophet. What bothered me about that statement was that Isaiah prophesied about a lot of future events, and so did Jeremiah, and they never happened within that prophet's lifetime. So would that not, would we not consider him a false prophet? But when I'd bring that up for in class, I would kind of be wrote off. Okay, Deuteronomy 13. Here's a test for a false prophet. Starting in verse 1, it says, When there arises among you a prophet, dreamer of dreams, and he shall give you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder shall come true, of which he has spoken to you, saying, I'm going to stop there. Now Yahweh, Yahweh is speaking to the people through Moses, Moshe. He says, When there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he'll give a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder shall come true. So right here, even a false prophet can tell something, and it's going to come true. Just because uh, something comes true doesn't make that person a prophet. And it says right here, it says, when he says this and it comes true, he says, let us go after other mighty ones or other Elohim which you have not known and serve them. Do not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for Yahweh, your Elohim, is trying you or testing you to know whether you love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being. Walk after Yahweh, your Elohim, and fear him and guard his commands and obey his voice and serve him and cling to him. Yahweh would send false prophets in among the people to test them. 
And these false prophets would give a sign or a wonder. And to give a sign or a wonder is not just foretelling of an event. They would do something miraculous. And this is what's going to happen during the tribulation period with the false prophet and the Antichrist. They're going to give signs and wonders, and they're going to happen. Just because a sign or wonder or healing happens within a certain realm, charismatic realm of these TV preachers, does not make that person a true follower of Messiah. Because this prophet here, who was considered a false prophet, gave a sign that happened, and a wonder that happened. But one of the things that differentiates a false prophet from a true prophet is the true prophet is always telling the people to obey Yahweh's word and come back to Yahweh. The false prophet is saying, don't worry about Yahweh's word. Let's go follow these idols, mighty ones, or whatever it may be. And this is something that the prosperity gospel and these TV preachers, and I can name a whole bunch of them, they do this. They're false teachers. And I know some claim, don't speak against Yahweh or the Lord's anointed. Okay, I'm going to call a spade a spade. When you have someone standing up on TV, I don't care what kind of sign they give, they may say the name Jesus 20 times, but if they're getting you to follow a prosperity message, telling you what you want to hear, and getting you to follow after your riches, then you're putting your riches before Yahweh. And Yeshua said that if you, you, know, you can't serve two, you can't serve Yahweh, and you can't serve mammon at the same time, which is riches. So you've got to make a decision. And there's some of them, and I'll, I'll go and say his name, Crefo Dollar, will say that you are little gods and that whatever you say is spoken into being. Now, I think we need to be careful with our words because we can hurt people and we have life and death within our tongue. I believe that. I understand that. And we can't hurt someone and we can destroy a person's character which was done to me growing up meet people telling me I was unworthy telling me you're not going to mount anything calling me stupid it affected me yes words affect you but when you start telling someone that they can be identical to the very creator of this universe then what they're doing is they're saying the exact same thing that that shining one who is known as the serpent in the garden who is Satan said to Adam and Eve that you will be just like Yahweh and when someone starts saying to follow them and they start giving all these messages and saying that you will be little G gods that you can create like he did, they're following a lie, the lie that's from the pit of hell. So a false prophet can give you a sign, it can give you a wonder, they, and they can come true, but they lead you away from Yahweh's word. And the false teachers of the day according to what we were reading here, going back to Second Peter, says that they will introduce destructive teachings. There's a lot of destructive teachings. And one of the most destructive teachings that I see out there is ignoring the commands of Yahweh. Saying that they were nailed to the cross and done away with. This is very destructive. The reason it's very destructive is why was Israel always sent into captivity. What is the main thing that sent them into captivity? Disobedience to Yahweh's word. One of the main ones that caused them to go into captivity, especially when you deal with Jeremiah, is they violated the Sabbath. Now we're gathering on the Sabbath for 70 years, which means he put a year for each Sabbath they violated. You know, they violated all these Sabbaths and they were in captivity for 70 years. A lot of times he says, they violated my Sabbaths, you violated my Sabbath, you brought injustice in, you violated my Sabbath. The Sabbath is big. Why is the Sabbath big? The Sabbath is big because that's his day. That's his day that he set aside for us to rest, for us to have family time, me, my wife, and my children, for us as believers to fellowship and be with him on his day of rest. But because of the Catholic Church, which I think is very pagan, and I know some people might disagree with me, but it's filled full of paganism, worship of Mary, worship of idols, following all these destructive teachings that have been brought in, and they deny the very one that bought them, who is Yeshua. 
and I think there's a lot that's happening today. The reason believers and and we've having a lot of persecution with Christians, like I believe the man that was has done some shooting. They said that he was targeting Christians. There's a lot of people targeting Christians. Islam targets Christians. Islam tar- hates Jews and hates Christians. And there's persecution coming. And I wonder sometimes is that persecution on believers because they're violating his Sabbath. I mean, all throughout the known Christian world, Sunday is considered the day of worship of Yahweh when that's not true. The Sabbath is. I think that's one of the most destructive teachings that has infiltrated the church and it's, that is still there today. And honestly, we gather on the Sabbath and we want to honor the Sabbath. And when we made that decision to honor the Sabbath and we put teachings saying that the Sabbath was not done away with, we've actually been ostracized by people. All it is is we're worshiping on, on, on the Sabbath. And when we start talking to them, they say, no, you need to worship on Sunday or, well, I can worship any day of the week. I worship every day of the week. Okay, then won't you gather with us on, on the Sabbath and worship? You're being legalistic. Well, if you can worship every day, why can't I worship on one day? If you want to choose your day of Sunday as worship, which that's what you want to do, I think that's in violation of Scripture because it clearly says we're together on Shabbat, which is the first appointed time of Yahweh. People ignore that one in Leviticus 23. It says these are Yahweh's appointed times. And it lists Shabbat, the Sabbath, as the first one of the festivals that we're to gather in, together with. But people ignore that. They always jump right over to Passover and skip Shabbat. But Shabbat is an appointed time. I'll quit chasing that rabbit for right now. It says in verse 2, it says, And then many will imitate their unrestrained self-abandoning behavior through whom the genuine path will be slanderously defamed. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that they would not become a Christian because... Because it's full of a bunch of hypocrites. And you know, I've said this to my wife several times, that you really cannot tell the difference between the world and the church because of what's going on. I mean, they look identical. There's immorality all around the world. and There's immorality in the church. And what happened in Ezekiel when Yahweh said that he will restore these people for his namesake because Israel slandered and profaned his name among the nations. Why did they profane his name among the nations? They claimed to be followers of Yahweh, yet they lived and worshipped the pagan idols, and they lived just like pagans. This is what's going on in the church today. And so, in verse 3, And so with covetousness, they will exploit you with fabricated messages whose long-awaited judgment is not inactive, and their destruction is not sleeping. Verse 4, Because if Yahweh did not have pity on the messengers who were rebelling, by sparing them, but instead with gloomy cords cast them into the pit within the earth while being watched over has handed them over to judgment. And neither did he have pity on the ancient world system by sparing them, but instead watched over Noah, or Noah, the eighth proclaimer of justice after bringing a flood upon the world of those transgressing the Torah, or the law. I'm going to stop here for just a minute. Kepha is using scripture and he's going into the Torah as an example of what happened. And he's talking about the false prophets and false teachers. So he's not doing these things in order. And it talks about having pity on the messengers. And some translation says angels who are rebelling. And they've got this teaching that these angels are the ones that came in in, in Genesis 6 and took wives of the women, the the daughters of men, because they saw them pretty and they had the Nephilim. You know, there's a whole bunch of teachings called the serpent seed and the Nephilim and all this other stuff, which is destructive teachings. They're false teachers. They're twisting scripture. The messengers in heaven, the supernatural beings, the spiritual beings who are messengers of Yahweh, this is what Angelos means, the same thing as Malach, which means messenger that was sent, someone that was sent, they don't marry. What happened in Genesis 6 was Yahweh destroyed man because he was violating his Torah, and we see this right here. They violated Torah. But what Kepha is doing first is he's talking about those messengers who rebelled. Now those messengers are, I believe, is dealing with what happened in number 16. And when it says they were 
bound with these gloomy cords and cast into the pit within the earth. Or as this translation here says, they delivered them into chains of darkness to be kept for judgment. But the word here is Tartarus, which means a pit within the earth. And it's a Greek word talking about, you know, where a prison where you know, people were bound in this prison. But in number 16, I'm going to think it's number 16. This is dealing with Korah, which is something that Kepha is going to talk about. He's going to talk about Korah. And Yehuda, or known as Jude, also talks about Korah, the rebellion of Korah. And what happened with the rebellion of Korah? Well, Yahweh chose Aaron as to be the high priest. He was of the tribe of Levi, a Levite. So was Korah. There's a group of people that wanted to have the priesthood. They were already given something. They were already given positions of what they need to do. If you go back and starting with numbers and read up to number 16, you see that Korah and his family were giving certain things to do within the role as being priests. They were priests, but they were not high priests. So Korah said that he wanted, and that family and they got together, wanted to be high priests. So Moshe said for them to get their censers and put fire in it, and Yahweh is going to show who he's chosen to be high priest. And in number 16, 19, it says, And Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the door of the tent of appointment. Then this theme of Yahweh appeared to all the congregation. So Korah is leading a rebellion because he wants, to high, he wants the priesthood. He thinks Moses and Aaron are, are having it all for themselves, and that is just their own desire. And Moshe says, if you go down to verse 28, Moshe said, By this you know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these works, that they are not from my own heart. If these die as all men do, or if they are visited as all men are visited, then Yahweh has not sent me. But if Yahweh creates what is unheard of, and the earth opens its mouth, and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you know you shall know that these men have scorned Yahweh. And it came to be as he ended speaking all these words that the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. They were judged and the earth opened up and swallowed them whole. This is what the word Tartarus or Tartarus means is a pit within the earth which is a prison and these people rebelled Korah rebelled not only against you know, Moses and Aaron but they, they re he rebelled against Yahweh and Yahweh showed that you know, he has chosen Moshe and Aaron for this position and he didn't have pity on Korah and his whole family and all those people there and this is I believe this is what Kepha is pointing to because he deals with the scriptures not the book of Enoch not some of these extra biblical books that we have but he's dealing with scripture he said and neither did he have pity on the ancient world system or the ancient world by sparing them but instead watched over which means he kept Noah who is the eighth one a proclaimer of justice who is righteous the word righteousness or righteous here means someone who proclaims justice this word is used as a as a person who speaks out for those who are being treated unjustly that's a proclaimer of justice and this is what Noah was was speaking out against and we know that Noah and the flood is probably one of the most known things in scripture even an unbeliever knows about Noah and the flood but the reason the flood was brought according to Kepha here is that the world he brought it upon the world because of those transgressing the Torah the law they were transgressing and this is the world of the wicked the word here for wicked in the Greek is asebon which is for the Hebrew word rasha rasha means to leave the path purposefully because you don't want to follow it Hebrew is a descriptive language and when you got the word for sin which is chata that means to wander or stray from the path 
Torah means instructions or directions. And what they're used for is, just like we did in the country, Torah means directions given for a journey. And Yahweh has given us directions because you know, we learned when we were dealing with Sukkot that Kepha calls his body his sukkah, a, a tent, which is the skene in Greek, which is the same word used in the Septuagint for sukkah. So we live in a sukkah. We're, the kingdom is not here yet. We're not living in the kingdom. The kingdom's coming. So we're wandering around in our sukkah, our tent, and we are a part of, you know, we're in the world, but we're not a part of the world. Now, there's a journey that we're on, and that journey is to Yahweh. That journey is going into his kingdom. So he's given us directions so that we can journey and walk with him, not just walk to him, but he walks with us because he's always with us. Greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world, or he that is with us. So Torah means directions for a journey. And whenever someone would give someone directions, that's Torah, instructions. You go this way, you turn this way, and you go that way. We do the same thing in the country. Turn it the big rock or turn it the big tree. Now, chata, which is sin, I know everybody in harmartia, in the Greek, everybody says it means to miss the mark, like you shoot a boat, an arrow, and the arrow misses the target. That's the main one that it's focused on. But the Hebrew word actually means to wander off the path by not following the instructions, and you get lost. You're wandering around. You, you've got a mark you're trying to get to, but you don't follow the directions, so you're wandering around. I've done that before GPS happened. You know, before I had GPS, I wandered around trying to figure out where I was at. I strayed off the path. Now, rasha, wickedness, is what's used here, which I've got translated as those transgressing the Torah. Rasha means to despise the directions and purposefully lead the path. You don't, you ball up the directions, you throw them away. You know, some men do that when the wife's trying to tell them where to go. They'll ball up the directions and go away. Let's look on over to verse 6. He also passed judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah with destruction, having reduced them to ashes, having made them an example for those who are going to transgress the Torah, or for those who are going to be wicked, or live wickedly, as this version has it. Sodom and Gomorrah was an example. And a lot of people are ignoring the fact that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of their wickedness. Churches today, government, are allowing wickedness and they're pushing their agenda and making laws that proclaim and, ex what do you call it, exemplify immorality. Solomon and Gomorrah was destroyed because of the very same thing. And it says in verse 7, it says, Yet he rescued righteous Lot, and we know that righteousness means someone who stays on the path or someone who is following Torah he's obeying the directions so right here we see that Lot even though he had some sin incest he was an individual that was staying on the path he was following Torah who was worn down by those lawless people's self-abandoning way of life because in seeing and hearing lawless actions that righteous man was tormenting his upright life or soul while living among them day by day and there's his first big mistake he saw the beautiful green plain he saw everything that was out there and he wanted to live near it now when Lot his wife and his two daughters were taken from there by the messengers that Yahweh sent that was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah Lot's wife did one thing she looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt they were told to leave and not to look back. Looking back is a sign that they, you know, the, the heart is longing for something that's there. And what happens is, I think that a lot of us tend to want to associate with friends who are immoral, and we associate with this lifestyle, even though we're trying to be separated from this lifestyle. But when we do that, we get pulled into it. And this is one of the things that we're going to talk about in a minute that these false teachers do because of this self-abandoning way of life is they entice you, they seduce you, and they pull you into it. And verse 9 says, Yahweh has known how to rescue devoted people from temptation, but keeping the wicked people 
being punished for the day of judgment and especially those who are themselves walking after the flesh and self-indulgent cravings of defilement and who are despising ownership daring self-willed people while speaking evil of honorable ones which is pointed back to number 16 I believe whereas the messengers who are greater in strength and ability do not bring a slanderous judgment against them before Yahweh Moses and Aaron didn't bring a, a railing accusation against Korah before Yahweh they didn't go and start saying look you called us to this and they're doing this no actually Moses was trying telling him don't do this don't do this because he knew what was going to happen Moses was one that would ask Yahweh to d get rid of him and save the people so Moses was someone that you know, put the people ahead of himself but when you go back up let's look at verse 10 it says and especially those who are, are themselves walking after the flesh and self-indulgent cravings of defilement and who are despising ownership this ownership and I didn't touch on that in verse 1 it says these false teachers and false prophets in addition to bringing destructive teachings in they deny the owner who bought them the word can also mean redeem them who is our owner it's not some of them have master in here but the word in the Greek is despote which means is it's not like kurios which means master despote means someone who bought a slave and who owns a slave a despot would be the English word for it they're denying the one who bought them and when you look at what Shaul says that he is a bond servant. Even Kepha says that they are a bond servant. They are a bond slave, which means they were bought and paid. And the owner of them is Messiah. And these people here are denying, not only denying the owner who bought them, which is Yeshua, but they're despising his ownership, which means they don't want to follow him. They don't want to do what he says. And if you're if you're working and and your supervisor tells you something and and you say, well, I despise you. I'm not going to do it. Are you going to still be working there? Are you gonna, I think you'll be fired. But this is what they were doing. And they were also walking after the flesh. They wanted to be self-indulgent. They, they wanted to give full vent to their flesh and to satisfy it. Now let's go to verse 12. But these people, just like unreasoning natural animals who have been born for capture and destruction after speaking evil of those whom they cannot understand will be corrupted by their own moral depravity verse 13 and who will, will receive back for themselves a payment worthy of wickedness while honoring pleasure as a daily indulgence they are spots and blemishes <coughs> excuse me who take exuberant delight in their deceptions while feasting with you Okay, I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. Where it says that there are natural, there are natural beasts in verse 12, but these like unnatural reasoning beasts have been born to be caught and destroyed. There's a word for destruction which we get, which we see transliterated called Apollyon or Apollea, which means destruction. But this word right here in the Greek means to decay, to decompose. It means to be separated into the elements of the different elements that compose compose something. It's, it's to break down something as for a dead body that decomposes. Yeah, it carries the meaning of destruction, but it <coughs> is used of someone's moral depravity, the moral decay. We talk about the decay of society. This would be the word used for decay of you know, it's decay for like decaying of society and who have been born for capture also could be captivity because it means to see something to take a hold of it and capture it and hold it as a prisoner so these animals are bred natural animals that are bred for captivity and destruction they're sacrifices sacrifices were bred captivity and actually for you know for the sacrifice but I think since he's talking about the animals he's equating them with the people these false teachers and he's saying that they're born into captivity and when you read on you see that they're captive by their desires and their lusts and by being captive of those desires and lusts they're decaying because you know, 
they're they're being morally deprived. And you, the more they go and the more you watch them, the more you see it. And they speak against whom they cannot understand. And what happens is, is when they see someone not following what they're doing, they can't understand that person. They speak out against them. Which those that decide that they want to follow Torah, like me and my wife have, there are people who don't understand that. And I'm not saying that they're bad people. But they slander us for doing what we're trying to do by following his word. And this is what these false prophets, these false teachers that are going to, that are within the in the body today, speak out against those who are trying to live a life that is righteous. And I think that if you're going to live that life that is righteous, instead of doing like Lot did and living amongst everybody, you need to separate yourself. I know you can't separate yourself from all the immorality that's here, but if you got friends that like to go to the bar and carouse and watch the ball game and they flirt with the waitresses and all that, you don't need to be a part of that. Yes, there's immorality in the world, but when you start associate your friends and you go out with them or ladies night or whatever they're doing and there's immorality that's involved you need to pull yourself away from that and it's not saying to stop being their friend but you need to stop putting yourself in a position to where you'll be tempted to follow the indulgent cravings of your flesh because this is what these false teachers do and that we're getting ready to read about is they entice people they seduce them by their flesh and right here where it says that they are spots and blemishes who take exuberant delight in their deceptions while feasting with you. Possessing the full eyes of an adulteress and unceasing from sin while seducing unstable persons who are possessing a heart having been trained up in covetousness. Or cursed children who immediately, who after immediately leaving the path were led astray following after the way of Balaam of Besor who loved the wage of wickedness. All right. Now we're getting into Balaam as another example. Kepha here is saying that these people, these false teachers, they're spots and blemishes, which means they're defiled, they're unclean. Any unclean animal, the spot and blemish of an unclean or of an animal, rendered it useless for service or devotion to Yahweh as a sacrifice. Doesn't mean the animal, even if it was a clean animal, like, like the sheep, which was used for a sacrifice, when for the sacrifice of, of Pesach, it had to be without spot or blemish and they had to watch it to make sure there's no spot or blemish and then keep it saying these have spots and blemishes which means they're not fit for service to Yahweh and if we have spots and blemishes then we're useless we're not fit to serve him and this is why we need to live a life and that's clean and that's perfect and that's why Yahweh says to be set apart as he set apart to be perfect as he is perfect because it means to be without spot or blemish. And to be without spot or blemish, there's only one way to do it. Read his word, do what it says. These people take delight in their deceptions. Now, this one says, reveling in their own deceptions while they feast with you. I've noticed in some, I, I guess, a preacher's conference is one thing that some of the preachers would get up there they would set their the Bible on the pulpit they would open it up and then they would walk away from it and go into this massive rant about things and you could see it in their face that they were just you know they were just ranting saying a bunch of incoherent junk to be honest with you but they were reveling in that they were they I think some of them knew that they were deceiving the people and there's some on, even if you watch, watch the TV preachers, judge them by the word, they revel in that deception because people are sending them money. That's what they want. They want the money. I mean, they, I think some, even some preachers are peddling Yahweh's word for money and for gain, and that's wrong. I mean, yeah, the one who teaches needs to be supported by those who are hearing, and like Shaul says, don't muzzle an ox as it's treading the grain which means those who are called to do this needs to be supported by a body of believers. But there are some that take great delight in deceiving others so that they can get the money. And this is what Balaam was doing. And Kepha pulls out Balaam because Balaam was told not to go and curse Israel. Balak wanted him to come curse Israel. <coughs> Yahweh said, don't go. 
They asked him again, said, we'll give you more riches. He wanted the riches. So he prayed again, can I go? So Yahweh said, okay, you go, but you only say what I want to tell you to say. And if we look here, we get ready to talk about his, his donkey. And I'm going to cut it off in just a minute. It says, yet he held a rebuke of his own evil scheme from a speechless donkey or pack animal. After it proclaimed in a man's voice, restrained the prophet's insanity or madness. And it says, these people are waterless springs, clouds driven by whirlwind to whom the gloom of total darkness in that age has been reserved because while they open while they are openly proclaiming worthless exaggerations they entrap with self-indulgent cravings of the flesh with its debaucheries those who have really escaped from them by conducting their behavior with deception while promising them personal freedom while being bond slaves to moral decay themselves because to whatever anyone succumbs himself to he has been enslaved by this thing. When you have a group of people whose heart has been trained up to covet and want what the Joneses has, to always see something better on the other side, it's easy for them to be enticed. Balaam was a prophet for hire. He loved the wages of wickedness, which means he got paid to do wicked things. And he was going even though Yahweh said, don't go with them. He still wanted to go with them. Yahweh said, you're going to say what I tell you. So on the way, on the travel, it's implied here that he was trying to figure out how he could curse this people and get paid for it, even though Yahweh said, don't do it. He was trying to figure out how to obey what Yahweh said, but also do what this guy wanted him to do so he can get some money. This is what's implied here. And if we know the story, the donkey saw that messenger, the fiery messenger with the sword that was going to kill him, and was trying to flee in protecting her master. And because he started beating her, Yahweh loosed the donkey's vocal cord so that the donkey could talk. And to me, if a donkey talked to me, that would freak me out. But Balaam decided to carry on a conversation with the donkey and tell the donkey that it was dumb. But what happened is that when he got there, he knew that Yahweh was going to kill him if he disobeyed him. So what he did was, instead of cursing Israel, he blessed them. Those two times in, in Numbers 24, I think it's 23, 24, and 25, you see that blessing which shows also it's a Messianic prophecy. So you got a, a pagan prophet also gives a prophecy, a, a foretelling of the Messiah who's coming from the line, the tribe of, you know, line from the tribe of Judah, the scepter from, from Judah. I mean, you've got all this within that prophecy from Balaam. But one thing he did, because he loved his wages so much he still told Balak how to mess up Israel and how did they mess up Israel he said give them your daughters and take their daughters intermingle with them intermarry with them become a part of them and then you can have what they have and you can lead them into debauchery and immorality and that's what happened they began to follow other idols and sovereigns and Yahweh didn't like it and he put a stop to it and this is what Kepha is, is using as an example of those prophets. Those prophets, false prophets in the past, would come up and say something that would be true, and they would be deceptive, and they'd look, you know, live doing everything that everybody else is doing, say this, and it's there, it happens, and then they say, well, let's go follow somebody else. Let's, let's put Yahweh's word away, let's get away from Yahweh, because we can have all this. We can have all this, this abundance if you just quit following Yahweh. That's what Satan said in the garden to Adam and Eve, that you'll be like him. He knows that, and you'll know good and evil just like he does. These teachers on TV say, do this, send me a seed of your money, and you'll be blessed. You send a thousand dollars, you'll reap a hundredfold. And it entices people because they're unstable. And that word unstable means they're constantly changing their beliefs and their attitudes. And they, they're not stable in one, one thing, and they're susceptible to being seduced. That's why I've got it translated as eyes of an adulteress, the full eyes of an adulteress. The adulteress is a married woman, and the full eyes of an adulteress means she has a desire to be an adulterer. She wants this. And these people have that desire because they want it. They want to exploit 
all these people around them for their own personal gain. And this is why I have a real bad problem with a lot of the TV preachers that are constantly asking for money. And not just them, but a lot of ministries that are constantly asking for money when if Yahweh has called them into it, I think he will provide for it. And ending with the last of what I said, it says that they're openly proclaiming worthless exaggerations. A modern word would be useless bloatware, if you know computers. It says they entrap with self-indulgent cravings of the flesh, with its debaucheries, those who have really escaped from them, or these things, by conducting their behavior with deception. What they're doing is they've gone in and, and they want to entice and get people in line with them so they're deceptive in their practice. They speak a good game, but they're deceptive. And what they do is they lead you into it. I mean, drug dealers do it. So false teachers can do it. They promise freedom, but they're also slaves to debauchery. And what happens is whoever you, whoever you give your full attention to you become a slave of that. You're enslaved by it. Like I said, this is one thing that I wanted to teach. I'm, I'm not going to be able to get completely through this. I'm going to stop right here for a moment. Any questions? Yeah, <coughs> okay, I may have, I guess I need to correct myself when I was talking about Lot. The question was, even though I, I didn't expound on it, that I said that Light was, Lot was a righteous man, even though he had incest in his life. What I mean by that, righteous, righteous is tzaddik, which means a person who stays on the path, someone who is, who is following the path. A sinner is someone who strays, but you bring them back to the path. Lot wasn't considered a wicked man because he didn't, you know, it tormented him. It tormented him to see the people in the debauchery that they were <coughs> that they were living in. But he followed Torah because he was a you know he was a nephew to Abraham, and Scripture considers him righteous, which means he followed Torah. But what happened was, you know, he sinned. And there's incest in his life. But being righteous doesn't mean you're sinless. The word righteous means that you're trying your best to stay on that path, that right path, and follow the directions or the instructions that you know, you've been given. The difference between a wicked person and a sinner is the wicked person don't want to follow this. They don't want it. They, they, they love sin. They go after it. A sinner is someone who is trying to follow this, but they mess up. They get seduced or enticed in some way and get entrapped. And I think this is why Lot was considered a righteous person, even though there was sin in his life. Just like David was considered a man after Yahweh's own heart, but there's sin in his life. If you look at the two people, they want to follow Yahweh. They did what, you know, they were trying their best to do what he said. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, incest came later, but he was. Yeah, actually, that was it. His <laughs> yeah, that was. You know, he was taken out because he was considered righteous. And after he was taken out, destruction happened. And I often wonder, and this is just my opinion, that his daughters got him drunk and they slept with him. I mean, there's no other way of saying it. But the thing they said was, there is no one on the face of the earth that can come into us like a man. So we need to go have sex with, you know, sleep with their dad so that they can continue the population of the world. I think they saw that and they thought that Yahweh was destroying the world by fire because everything around them was destroyed. All the cities of the plain was destroyed. And they were in a cave and they were hid. They were probably equating that with what happened to Noah. I'm not trying to justify it. But they were equating that by the terms that they were saying that there's no man on the face of the earth that can come into us. 
they were considering that Yahweh had done destroyed everybody because of their wickedness. And the only one that could continue the line were those two daughters and their dad. So yeah, I don't wanna yeah, I don't wanna give the impression that I'm justifying incest. Incest is wrong. I'm just trying based on scripture to give an opinion of why they did that, which based on what they said, I think they were they thought that the world had been destroyed. Or the people all the people had been destroyed, like the flood. Which is possible. Okay, the question is about the Catholic Church. If they are teaching about Jesus, how can they be considered false teachers and and practicing paganism? <coughs> Here's how. Deuteronomy 13 says, anyone who comes and gives a sign or a wonder, and it comes true, and they say, Let's follow other mighty ones. The word for mighty ones is Elohim, which means sovereign ones. Or follow, it's translated in a lot of translation, gods. Anyone who you give your worship to is considered your sovereign one. Yahweh says you don't worship anybody but him. You don't give your worship to anybody else. You don't pray to anybody else. The Catholic Church teaches you to pray to Mary. And this is something if you want to look at, According to Deuteronomy 13, Augustine is the one who brought in the veneration of Mary. They call her the co-redemptrix. They equate her with the the with the plan of redemption along with Yeshua. Matter of fact, they regard her in more esteem than they do a lot of them than they do Yeshua. And that is wrong. That's pagan. You're not to pray to anybody else. Matter of fact, they call her the Queen of Heaven. The only one in Scripture that I know is called the Queen of Heaven was Asherah, who was a pagan idol of fertility. They also have you bowing down to her statue. They have the statue of Peter in there near the Vatican, wherever it's at, where people go up to it and touch the toe. Actually, that was this statue of Jupiter or Zeus. It's not a statue of Peter. It's a statue of Zeus. They have you venerating all these these relics. They have you venerating the saints. You pray to St. Christopher, St. Peter, St. whoever you're praying to. That's the same thing as polytheism, praying to all these different different gods of the houses, deities of certain houses, deity you know, that can find something. You had the deity of lost stuff, the deity of perfection. You know, whatever there was a deity of the house, all they've done was equate that same deity with a saint that's found in scripture and they give it a scriptural name. They take altars that were used for pagan sacrifices and Yahweh said to destroy them, but they also have it written when they went into the area of the Great Britons, the Druids had all these altars and these buildings that were built. They sent a letter back saying don't destroy them, sprinkle them with holy water and tear down their relics and put our relics in there and it's consecrated for worship for Jesus. And that's wrong. That's that's a violation of scripture. You don't pray to anybody else. They teach all this prayer. They've got you know they're doing basically the same thing that the that you see in paganism. All they're doing is just giving it the name Jesus and adding a few scripture verses to it. That's the best way I can explain it. All right. Then I shall end it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I just pray that this teaching will, uh, if someone doesn't agree with it, that it will stir their heart to search your word out for a deeper understanding. I don't hold the, the corner market on your truth, Father. I just want to be a man who serves you and proclaims it and, and to be like the sound of a shofar that's warning people to come back to you. Father, open their hearts to your word, open their open their minds, give them understanding, and if anyone is caught up in, in any uh, situation, they're entrapped by these deceptive false teachers that are out there, Father, just open their eyes and, and let them see and, and to be set free and to have true freedom. 
Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you in Yeshua's name.